Um, and all the rest is all really in, in the book. Uh, and I think <laughs> I want to finish you really with just um, some tips here to think about. I've got 15. I used to just have uh, four. Um, I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but you can see that it's trying to get a more holistic view of eating that isn't just about calories, not about energy, but it's about the ethics, it's about thinking more about the quality of food, it's about where does it come from, um, and thinking how good is that food going to be for my gut microbes. And if you try and focus on that, and you um, change your, your diet, you don't quite know what to do, so what would my microbes like, then you can't go far wrong. And I think the other important thing is um, cook for yourself whatever you can. That means you're in control of what you're doing, what's going in. And finally, you absolutely have to enjoy eating. So with that, and the fact that I think knowledge is power, I will stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm just, I think in the pre presentation, you mentioned that you use nutritionists um, in the Zoe company. Um, why don't you use dietitians? And um, dietitians follow um, public health advice, which are um, evidence based. So, thank you. I didn't, I didn't quite understand the question. You're saying hospital dietitians? Because dietitian is, has a very specific meaning. Uh, in this country, it means someone who's trained in dietetics to treat people in hospitals or with special conditions. They're not supposed to, uh, not trained to offer advice to the general public. Uh, if you're talking about nutritionists, then that's a whole different uh, group of people, and there's lots of different categories of nutritionists. Uh, in general, people, dietitians do follow guidelines for people with specific diseases, or they may have anorexia, or people have had half their, their, their gut removed, or people with cancer therapies and these, these things. So we struggle in this country because we have these various terms. We don't know quite what they mean. We don't have a, a, an overall um, uh, agreement on, on what training a nutritionist mean, needs, and there are lots of different groups of them. You know, some are more alternative, some are more uh, strictly adhering to, um, to the, these original guidelines. Um, I'm not commenting on, you know, I think there's all, the whole range, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, there aren't nearly enough nutritionists or dietitians to advise everybody. So if you are lucky enough to get to see one, that's amazing. Uh, you know, you're either very rich or very lucky. And uh, I think what I'm trying to do is to let people, uh, you know, with these, these tricks, these digital devices, have access to, in a way, their own pocket nutritionist. And through these books as well, get some insight into that without being one of these, these lucky few. Uh, because there just aren't enough people trained, and many of them are trained in the old ways, which I, I think I believe, uh, you know, have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much, Tim, for doing this very good work, uh, because this is something, uh, as you rightly said, really ought to be taught in all schools. Food is just the beginning and end of everything. So thank you very much for that. Now, the two um, sort of challenges I find I have, and of course, you'll say I have to buy your book for that. So <laughs> the, the first is, I find increasingly labeling is a big problem, especially since we came out of the European Union. I've actually seen in some shelves, they actually have products with, um, you know, they've stopped labeling it properly. Um, the second thing, of course, aligned with that is the issue of food fraud, which, which is a big issue now. So you might think you're buying honey and it's 70% um, or more of sugar syrup. And it's that challenge of how do you source um, good quality food other than cycling down to the farm yourself every weekend or whatever, um, which probably means you ought to eat less anyway. So, <laughs> so, so there's that. Thank you. And then finally, although you, I know you say about your, 
um, you promote your wonderful company and what it does. But I think another way um, through, isn't it, if you record and keep a close watch, your own personal diary um, of how you react, your body reacts when you eat food, which I've been doing over time. And so whereas porridge, oats, organic, um, doesn't work for you, it works for me, and I don't get any spikes. My father lived to 101 having porridge every day. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. That was a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, no, very good points. Um, I think, uh, think about labelling. We're in a labelling crisis at the moment, and the government is bringing in this um, sugar, uh, sugar, salt, fat uh, labelling on foods, which is supposed to transform the, you know, the work. But as I've told you, just that doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the food. So that's not going to help at all. And... We're stuck with, you know, all the interesting stuff is in such small font that you need a microscope to see it often. But in general, we've got to learn to look at labels quickly, realize that if it's got more than 10 ingredients, you don't, haven't heard of most of them, you should be looking at something else, or you just pick things like, I'll just look at the fiber content, or uh, judging it that way. I, you know, we need is ultra-processed food labeling to say how ultra-processed is this. There's no agreement on that at the moment, but that's what we need to be moving towards. Some countries in South America do have a system like that. They put a black dot on anything that's ultra-processed. Very easy to spot. Um, I, the food lobby will never let that happen in this country. Um, food fraud is a big problem. There's a lot of it in the book. <laughs> um, and I was shocked how, you know, even 50% of sushi is uh, not what it claims, and uh, we're so easily fooled. Uh, by these things. And it's all about, you know, f trusting your source and learning just to be a bit more suspicious on things and not buying the cheapest thing. You know, and I learned a lot from Italian, Italian colleagues and friends and saying, well, they would never buy an olive oil in a supermarket, ever. Only tourists do that. Uh, they would go to their local shop that they trust and they, they would, would get to know them. And I think we need to just change our, our way of thinking about this. Um, and finally, I think you said, um, uh, how can you do any of this without spending any money, basically, is what you were sort of saying. Absolutely. And I think by understanding these things are happening, what I want people to do is to, um, you know, do what you can without spending. Many, many people are quite sensitive to their bodies if they sit and listen to them. Um, you know, if, if you, you know, whether you have an app or you, you have a notebook, as you suggested, you know, have your oat porridge and then just record every hour how you feel. And this is, in a way, what this technology is enabling people to do easier. But some people will be able to do this themselves. I think there are a large number of people who, who aren't very in tune with their body that find it hard. I, you know, until I had that extreme experiment, I never spotted this at all. I never spotted my sugar peaks. Some people do, a lot of people don't. But absolutely, 100%. People can go out there and start thinking about food and how it affects them, their mood, their sleep, their energy, all this stuff. Absolutely, go for it. You know, and I think you can learn. Uh, some people can learn quite a lot from that, but I think it's not everyone. Hi, Tim. Um, just got a couple of questions. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for a really interesting talk, and also thank you for keeping us all informed through COVID as well. I used to all regularly listen to your... So thank you for that. Um, I, I've, I've just retired from the NHS. I worked in the public health team. And the only literature we could ever get was food for life and the eat well plate. How on earth is the NHS ever going to update its guidelines when there's so much evidence around now? Well, um, you know, they're 10 years out of date at least. Um, it takes them years to change their guidelines, and they have to get the approval of the food industry, would you believe, before they're allowed to change it. Um, you know, I think there's at least two or three members of the food industry who sit on their advisory panels. And, uh, you know, this is why we're in this terrible state. We need to just totally change that system. Realize that it's corrupt, and that they're being essential. You know, we complain about countries like China having sort of bribery and corruption things. We're exactly the same. It's just called lobbying, you know, and it's throwing millions and millions at politicians. 
to do the same thing. So from Flora Margarine, hmm? I think Flora used to do provide lots. Well, of, uh, lots of you know you can go through the whole gamut that yeah. you know the Apple manufacturers don't have enough money to lobby government to say can you help us here or you know subsidise leaks or whatever it is. But if someone's mass producing biscuits or um, some margarine, it's you know it helps an industry in in some MPs uh, local area and uh, you know it's providing jobs and this kind of stuff so this is why it happens and they do produce it cheaply so currently all the government thinks about is let's keep it as cheap as possible it's the only thing that matters although it's costing the taxpayers much more in healthcare costs diabetes costs it's costing us hundreds of billions in future healthcare costs so it's short termism that's all just got one other question. Um, what do antibiotics do to your gut microbiome? And what should you do if you've been on, as many people are, on courses it's, of them? Okay, well, they're, they're a very blunt tool. So they, they sort of, it's like a nuclear explosion. It takes out a lot of species that um, you don't want taken out. So you take the good ones out with the bad ones. And the speed at which you grow back your good ones is highly variable. So some people, they get it really everything comes back in a week others it can take months some never come back and we think that uh, using fermented foods and possibly probiotics after you finish the course is useful okay uh, if you do it at the same time there's the data is conflicting about whether it could be harmful uh, because you might favor some microbes more than other but give an unnatural way of doing it so yeah, we should have less antibiotics. Obviously, you need when you take take it when you need it, but um, try and take the shorter course possible, and then really hit with you know your 30 plants a week. Hit it with fermented foods, everything you've got afterwards. Um, and then there's just me one last question. There's, I'm afraid there's so many questions, but because time is running short, from the live chat, what uh, this is from Cat? What is the relationship between sleep and diet? Sleep and diet. I used to think there was no, no relationship, uh, naively, until we started studying it as part of these, uh, these Zoe studies. And it's really a really crucial player in how you respond the next day to food. So people have a, a really bad, restless night, um, say so you get five hours sleep, it's poor quality, uh, will all overeat the next morning, and the brain is screaming for carbs. Right? And you've, we've probably all noticed this. You know, oh, gosh, I need some toast and jam or something. You know, I've got to get, you know, my, to get myself back on kilter. So, uh, so basically you overeat the next day and you give yourself big sugar spikes. And then you can end up in a bit of a vicious circle because the more of these spikes you're having, the poorer your sleep quality. So it's really important for people to realize after a bad night's sleep, you, you know, we're trying to sort of, work out getting an alert on your phone or something that says, you know, no, 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 don't go there, don't go for the toast, go for some yogurt or skip breakfast because your, you know, your body is tricking you. It doesn't really need the sugar. Um, it, it just needs to calm down and uh, get a good night's sleep later. Um, so it has a huge effect. And um, we also know that uh, we're doing these studies on intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating but if you can extend the time you're not eating, so just cut out snacking and all these things, you can improve your metabolic health, reduce your blood pressure, improve your sleep, and uh, you, you know, may also lose some weight as well. And that's why we're doing this, this big uh, community research project with the Zoe Health, Act, health Study, the ex-COVID study, to try and get... We've now got about 50,000 people doing the study have signed up for it, and you know, we're going to answer a lot of these questions because it includes how did you sleep, what's your mood, what's your energy, uh, just by changing your hours of eating, not changing what you eat. So, yeah, it's really important. Perfect. Thank you so much again for tonight. And we are so, we have all learned so much. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Great questions.